Good afternoon and welcome everybody to the Tallgrass Prairie Spring Webinar Series. As you know, we have four focal areas that the Tallgrass Prairie Landscape Conservation Cooperative addresses, and those are prairie reconstruction or restoration, river restoration focusing on floodplains, agroecology, and urban conservation. Last week we heard from two communities of practice, one the Floodplain Science Network, which focuses on the floodplain river restoration focal area for the LCC and the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative focusing on large-scale prairie reconstruction techniques. So we'll continue this week with the other two technical advisory groups uh, being the Agroecology Group and Andrew Stevenson speaking to that uh, in the second part of this uh, today's webinar. And opening the webinar, Kristen Shaw, our Urban Conservation Coordinator will be speaking about Ecological Places in Cities Network. All right, so like Gwen said, um, I'm going to present today on the Urban Conservation Focal Area, or better known as um, the Ecological Places in Cities slash EPIC Network. Um, my name is Kristen, and I'm currently serving as the Urban Conservation Coordinator for RLCC. Like Gwen had given you the preview um, just recently, um, we have four focal areas, including agroecology, prairie restoration, river restoration, and urban conservation. Um, I just wanted to show this uh, as a reminder to folks uh, to give you kind of a place to, to reference and start from. So my journey started the same time that the EPIC journey began, began uh, back in 2014, and the steering committee of the LCC in 2012 met and had established the, the focal areas and decided that as one of the results of the setting up the tag, they wanted to create an urban conservation workshop where we could bring together participants um, to understand kind of the state of the science and what the needs are. At that workshop, we had 46 participants from across five different states, inclu including Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, and Minnesota, including a diverse uh, group, group of participants from nonprofits, state and federal agencies, um, uh, researchers, and that covers pretty much the, the whole gamut of folks. Um, but during that process, we covered kind of research projects that happened throughout the, the Midwest and went through the process of a collective impact to understand how we could come together as a network um, to work on urban conservation issues across the Midwest. Um, and at the time, we had come up with an acronym um, since you all know, uh, working for um, your agency, we all love our alphabet soup. Um, and the acronym would have been MUCKIN, Midwest Urban Conservation Network. Um, but luckily, one of our uh, members had decided, let's sit, think of something a little more catchy. Um, and we started with ecological places and cities. So at the workshop, um, we, we thought about what are the, the functions of urban conservation and where are people working in this field? Um, and how can we, as a network, um, grow and expand upon the work that's already being done so we're not um, reinventing the wheel all the time. So we, we decided there are six kind of focal areas um, or functional areas where people work in, and that include education and train the trainer, wildlife conservation, habitat restoration, community re revitalization, landscape planning, and research. After the workshop, um, we were tasked with actually getting this thing established. <laughs> and so uh, during my part time with the LCC, as I was a graduate student at the time, um, we mapped out a process to try and get a network created. Um, and as you see here, this is from the framework document that we had created. And we started with uh, us asking our members um, or the folks that had joined the workshop what resources they had available to them and what were the resource gaps. Then based on um, those things that were available to them, we narrowed down our themes, which still focus around the same um, functional areas. And then we tried to create then a group of um, core team members to work on mission, vision, and goals of EPIC. And then we're going to create um, outreach to get people on board and ended up doing some strategic planning uh, work around our business plan for the LCCs, which 
I'll talk about each of these kind of um, pieces separately. But at the end, you'll see this is kind of as far as we got. Um, so I won't spoil the last um, line of my talk, but um, you'll kind of see the, the process that we went through um, as we walked through this. So the framework we had created was really to kind of, we took all the notes from the workshop and looked at what were the things we wanted to accomplish. One was to create a network, since there wasn't one in existence at the time, um, connect people to nature and cities, since we're all aware that um, conservation is becoming less and less relevant, um, with less people out hunting and fishing, and the message not necessarily reaching our urban core audiences. And then we wanted to work across space and place. Um, and at the, the workshop, we had created a draft vision of the LC, the EPIC um, court network team, which was we are a network that reconnects or integrates people in nature in Midwestern cities, their surrounding work, working landscapes and natural areas. And here you can see the front page of the framework. And within that framework, we thought about how can we, across this giant landscape, functionally operate. And so we used the, the themes of green infrastructure thinking at a regional community and site scale, um, and created themes around connectivity, place, creating places for people and wildlife, and then focusing on individual actions. So this is the geographic perspective in those um, green infrastructure scales. So at the regional scale, it's really the, the LCC network, um, both the Eastern Tallgrass LCC and the Upper Midwest Great Lakes LCC. At the community, it's your large metropolitan areas that can really reach out to um, the other um, cities around them that are smaller. And then at the site scale, it's that individual city or town, or um, in some cases, you're the individual themselves making a difference for their, their ecosystem that they're living in. So at the regional scale, this is the Eastern Tallgrass um, map. Um, and as you can see within our LTC region, um, our landscape is um, entirely developed. <laughs> so um, this creates an opportunity to understand how we can incorporate green spaces um, across this landscape that can be um, cherished and used by all. Um, so at this regional scale, it's really about connecting at the landscape uh, level and seeing where you can fit in on, uh, in the bigger picture um, and across that entire landscape, maybe adding a little bit more green in here that isn't there already. At the community, this is really focusing on the places where we live, work, and play. Um, and as some people um, have said, like, what is urban? <laughs> and to me, uh, size doesn't matter. It, it's really about um, any place that we can create opportunities for wildlife and people to coexist. And at the site scale, it's, um, like I had mentioned earlier, it's that individual action, that community group that's really getting the group, uh, their, their community on board with um, implementing green infrastructure projects, green infrastructure as the actual um, on the ground green infrastructure, or um, planting monarch gardens with all of the current initiatives going on and things along that scale. And at, at each of these scales, we um, would provide, the idea was that we would provide um, a nexus so that people can share the practices and what's working in their, their city, their, um, their metropolitan statistical area, so that a city that wants to do something similar doesn't have to recreate the wheel. So we have all this great framework to start from and reached out to um, a lot of the folks that had been involved with the urban conservation tag, uh, technical advisory group, the um, urban, uh, the Midwest Urban Conservation Workshop, and based around those functional areas, we found representatives within the, the community um, that we're working in to focus on how within each of these focal areas we could come up with a, a real strong um, mission, vision, and then kind of a business plan, which is focusing mostly on research projects um, that we could roll out to folks working in urban spaces to kind of move the needle of conservation in those areas. Um, so our, our core team met together in September of 2015 um, and really narrowed down the idea of EPIC to really focusing on cultivating connectedness. Um, we wanted to create a network of cities and conservation groups working together towards a new vision that integrates 
nature's benefits and natural defenses with the, with the needs of our urban future. So it's really about sustainable living, coexistence, um, and we want to use advanced urban planning approaches along with the innovative civic leadership to ensure that urban nature and our future generations can grow and thrive together. So it's bringing the decision makers and the people that are on the ground doing work to the same table, looking towards the future to provide opportunities for everybody, um, include, not only within our generations, but within future. And here you can see the um, idea of green infrastructure, not only connecting people to nature, but connecting nature to nature. Um, you can imagine these hubs as the large um, uh, wildlife refuges, uh, the core, um, really that super awesome habitat within those refuges, and these linkages um, as uh, connections within urban spaces or your right-of-ways, your river connectivity, to really create, a, a, at the larger scale, a connected ha habitat um, uh, framework so that wildlife and people can then interact with this with nature at any step along the way. Um, and here you can see the great group of um, the core team that came together um, in September, um, and they're also a fantastic uh, fun group <laughs> beyond just having um, amazing tech, uh, technological um, uh, expertise and being fantastic, passionate people. Um, and I can say that a lot of these people aren't in the current positions that they had been a year ago. So right now we're looking for people that are at the same caliber um, and an add of amazingness to get involved with kind of next steps for this. So we, we created this vision and mission, and here are, is that language specifically, but we narrowed down these five lofty goals into three, um, even, well, they're still quite lofty, but three goals that you can see are, are, are kind of different. The first is to reconnect people to nature by integrating green infrastructure into community revitalization. So it ties into um, why nature is important for a community. Um, and then we want to establish ecologically resilient urban communities within our larger landscapes by championing, championing uh, habitat conservation at multiple scales. This gets back to that green infrastructure from your site scale all the way up to your regional. And then we wanted to showcase how social and economic benefits of healthy, healthy natural landscapes can promote green economies and foster community health and cohesion. Really getting to um, promote, promoting for a city, um, companies coming to their, their city, um, getting to those rural communities, communities that are starting to disappear because um, opportunities for jobs are leaving, and also at the same time as creating a, a community based on economics, we wanted to create a community um, for for people since we and and focus around um, diversity and getting everybody to the table so we can share our experiences um, and be a better community it, itself. So I said a lot of words there, <laughs> but simply put, Epic uh, the Epic Network wants to connect people to people, connect people to nature, and connect nature to nature um, at all of those scales along uh, along the green infrastructure uh, framework. So uh, at the same time during this uh, work, the business planning workshop, we had um, an opportunity to figure out what are the strategies that we would use to accomplish this. And the first is um, that it can be boiled down to delivering training, engaging communities, and filling in the gaps. The first is scaling up and linking across the landscape. The next is to promote best practices and um, technological transfer then capitalize on leadership and peer learning and networking, and lastly, um, have a pragmatic research agenda. And next I'll talk about um, the projects that we had established through our business plan, um, focusing mostly on that um, research agenda. Um, here's just a brief preview, all of the, the projects listed out, and I'm not gonna read all of the words off the slide, I just wanted to have this information for, for people that aren't on the line today, so it's all in one place. But, um, we have four projects. The first is really understanding the value of nature um, and creating a communi communication plan um, campaign so that people working in conservation within cities can, to, can translate to the decision makers within the city um, the value of the green spaces that they're trying to implement. Um, so why is it important to put in this bioswale um, here instead of 
in investing in a coffee shop, for instance. Um, and then this also gets to <clears throat> creating opportunities for networking um, and uh, getting people to understand the, the different practices that are happening across the landscape, be it from stormwater management to um, implementing monarch gardens, for instance. And speaking of monarchs, <laughs> um, if you were not aware, um, the monarch is in, um, imperiled. <laughs> it, it is um, currently the focus of a lot of conservation initiatives. And, and one of the reasons why um, EPIC kind of came to a point where a lot of our time, my time has been moved over to monarch conservation. The LCC has um, picked up on filling in the gaps for monarch conservation within urban spaces. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the monarch project at the end of this. Um, but basically, we wanted to understand how urban spaces uh, could potentially be a part of the equation to help uh, with creating habitat for the monarch. And next steps of the project are um, outlined here, and I won't, won't go into too much detail because we're currently in the process of um, figuring out what exactly we'll be doing. The, the next um, project we had suggested doing was a de creating a decision support tool for incre incorporating ecological places into cities. And I know it's lame to use your own name and a, a goal, but <laughs> this is the best way to kind of explain it. Uh, but really, it's trying to get cities to understand their place on the landscape um, through an EPIC certification, if that's something that um, resonates with cities. Um, but it, it really lets the city know where, they, where you are um, on the landscape, what you can contribute to um, the ecosystems around you, and then how do you operate at a social and ecological capacity. So understanding how the net, your community operates, what that values do they um, have, and then also understanding what metrics uh, you can have for evaluating greenness of a city, which is something that was important for a lot of our participants in the core team. The last project, um, which um, I'm really excited about, is really understanding the urban species and the impact on, on larger populations. So the, the intent was to shed light on which species really thrive in urban spaces and what that impact can be on the larger population um, across, for instance, a migratory corridor or um, a, a, specific, a specific region. So um, we would use a process similar to the Monarch Project where we would evaluate urban habitat um, across as small as your backyard all the way up to that big uh, park in the middle of your city um, if you're lucky enough to have one. And then understand how can cities um, promote habitat creation for specific species. Uh, and then in, con in conjunction with that, then understanding how you can communicate the value of these urban species to be a part of the equation when decisions are made on the landscape. Um, and as a, as a fun pilot project of this, uh, we had suggested creating a, a T, TV show on like um, what HG, the, whatever the um, TV shows are where they do home rebuilds uh, that would focus on migratory makeovers. How do you create um, habitat in your backyard um, and make it cool to have habitat instead of a lawn, for instance? Um, so I didn't go into all the details, but if you visit our website, plugging there, um, you can um, see the full breakdown of the projects and what we had proposed um, last year for funding. I had mentioned that I was going to give a brief preview of the Monarchs Eva City project, and I don't want to steal any thunder for next week, um, but this project started because, um, as you can see here in the Midwest, there's a lot of urban um, growth projected, and at the same time that this is happening, the monarch needs this this same region to um, successfully reproduce and migrate back down to have future generations of monarchs. Um, and we've no, we knew that there was a lot of momentum around creating habitat um, based on the Milky for Monarch project in St. Louis, and really wanted to figure out a way that cities could be a part of um, the the process and uh, and um, understand how they can be a part of conservation more than just education and outreach. Um, so the bigger question that we had when we started this project is that we know that cities need, need nature um, because each one of us needs our, our extra dose of nature, um, whether it be for um, uh, 
going out into nature and just kind of hitting a reset or um, just for health and recreation. But the bigger question, does nature or more specifically wildlife need cities? So um, we're looking at the places where we live, work, play, and worship for potentially creating habitat that benefits both people and pollinators as creating monarch habitat also benefits a whole suite of other species, um, whether it be from creating wetland habitat that has uh, nectaring sources during the entire migration period or prairie re uh, resources as well. Um, so with that, um, I wanted to close out um, the Urban Conservation Technical Advisory Group with um, the fact that the journey for urban conservation will continue within our LCC, but um, we're at a point now where we're asking, is it through EPIC, the EPIC network? Um, so right now I've um, started the process of creating a logic model and looking at other programs that are uh, potentially avenues like the Prairie Restoration Initiative and Floodplain Science Network that could operate as this mechanism um, at, for convening the community and sharing resources that are um, uh, out there already. Um, but with that, I um, have a few minutes for questions. Um, and if you have any thoughts or perspectives on that question, is EPIC the, the network that needs to to really become a, a true network and, and provide those resources, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So thank you, Kristen, for the presentation. We do have uh, several minutes for questions or, or even some discussion. I'd like to remind everybody that this session is being recorded. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or type a question into the chat box. Hi, this is Amanda Bokulpin. I have a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to what extent um, are you trying to engage with um, initiatives like the Grow Native program or, you know, in other ways try to emphasize um, using native plants in the green spaces? Oh, um, so that's that's a big – we haven't specifically reached out to Grow Native or any other um, specific group like that, but as part of the Monarch Initiative, like, that's a, a huge component is really – um, providing resources that are, are native to your to your local ecotype, um, and then <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of the Epic initiative, it's really focusing at the same kind of larger scale. How do you create habitat based on your local ecotype um, to provide that same kind of functional um, need as the the spaces around you? Um, so. Yes, we we think that it's important to use native um, plants from monarch to other species as well. That could potentially be utilizing urban spaces. Um, I don't know if that answered your question specifically, Amanda, but yeah, um, yeah, okay. And yeah, and so and I just want to remind everybody if you have um, more questions or are really interested in what the Urban Monarch view of a city project is create is really um, shaping up to be. Join us next week. Abigail Derby Lewis and Alexis Winter from the Field Museum will sh share um, preliminary results of both the geospatial mapping opportunities uh, as well as some of, some of the social science that they've um, done with this project. So thank you, Kristen, and we'll take a, a minute here to switch presentations over to Andrew Stevenson. Andrew is at the University of Northern Iowa, and he has been the Technical Advisory Group Coordinator for the Agroecology uh, Tag for the LCC over the past couple of years, and he'll be talking about some potential opportunities for engagement in that Technical Advisory Group. So, Andrew? Well, yeah, I just want to start. Uh, thanks, Kristen. You actually covered quite a bit of the uh, history behind the, the structure, so I get to um, avoid some of that stuff. But what I really want to cover initially is explaining a bit about why agroecology was identified as one of the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative's focal areas. Um, so in this tag, uh, an LCC, we're interested in conservation in the working lands of the Midwest. Um, so with the Midwest being the agricultural heartland of America um, and having one of the largest agricultural economies in the world, Agriculture is strongly uh, connected to our environment. Moreover, in Iowa, it 
is 85% of our environment. Um, so we believe that, uh, I, I want to start by uh, sort of having a shared definition of what agroecology means to all of us. So agroecology is a study of the ecological processes that operate in an agricultural production system. Um, so given that much of our LCC covers the Corn Belt region of the United States, uh, we're very interested in those agricultural production systems. And we believe that by applying the principles of agroecology, uh, we can improve our agricultural resilience to the environmental stressors that are becoming uh, increasingly unpredictable, whether that's rainfall, heat, pests, or other extreme events such as flooding or damaging storms, uh, while also increasing the ecosystem services uh, that the environment provides. So agricultural production systems and the surrounding areas, uh, they provide many ecosystem services, including habitat for wildlife. However, the level of the benefit is determined by those management practices and the intensity of them. Um, so some of the challenges we face in this region are the intensive, act, act, intensive activities such as tillage, drainage, irrigation, intensive grazing, fertilizer and pesticide use, um, which have considerable impact on their surrounding environments. What you see here is the total nitrogen yields um, for the Mississippi River Basin. And uh, you can almost draw an outline around the LCC, uh, the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie LCC, if you trace the very darkest brown, showing that we can uh, contribute quite a bit. Um, so in particular, fertilizer runoff uh, has been linked to both local algal blooms as well as the expansion of the hypoxic, hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but in addition, uh, the channelization um, and, uh, of, our, of our riverways, uh, smaller and larger, has led to um, water management being another major conservation concern, both in regard to uh, chemicals and, and other uh, byproducts of agricultural production in these intensive ways, um, as well as just the sheer amount of water that's uh, carried by the tens of thousands of miles of tile drainage in the region. So we're dealing with new ways to, to manage that. Um, so as our management intensity increases and our untilled areas decrease, uh, the value of agricultural land for plant diversity, wildlife habitat, water quality protection, as well as other ecosystem services decreases. Um, we're also Another challenge is that the economic drivers for crop production, grazing, agroforestry opportunities, they provide one of the greatest hurdles for conservation on our agricultural lands. <clears throat> so one of the things we have determined as an LCC is that we need to prioritize our conservation efforts um, and allocate our resources more efficiently or most efficiently uh, to, to get the most bang for our buck. Um, so to do so, there's three major research needs that we've identified. Uh, we need to understand what practices return the greatest conservation value, to understand which physical, whether it's the watershed or managerial, uh, such as cultural practices, um, have the greatest potential for improvement, and to understand what resources are available to support and leverage conservation efforts, whether that's different funding streams or uh, harnessing partnerships. What we can expect um, as outcomes is that we can create a system that has an increased amount of increased amount as well as quality of wildlife habitat that's integrated into our farmlands. That we can protect water quality for the 18 million people who live in the Mississippi River watershed and adjacent watersheds, as well as improve the ecology and economy of the Gulf by decreasing our con uh, nitrogen contributions and. Uh, while maintaining economically viable agricultural practices and systems um, and increase our food security and uh, prepare and create flexible systems um, to address the, uh, the facing challenges of unpredictable environmental stressors. Largely a strategy that's being used is uh, economics and incentives to influence our, our management practices and to promote putting habitat conservation on our agricultural working lands. Uh, and traditionally, this has been through opportunistic pathways um, based primarily on landowner willingness to participate. 
Um, however, recent efforts, uh, such as the Mississippi River Basin Gulf Hypoxia Initiative, which is a multi-LCC effort, um, as well as Mississippi River Basin Healthy Watersheds Initiative, uh, they've targeted watersheds um, in which water quality is significantly impaired and where we can have the greatest, uh, that have the greatest potential for improvement. The agroecology tag plans to, to build on the effort to prioritize resource allocation by supporting research to identify priority conservation areas and activities that will provide the greatest improvement to our wildlife habitat and water quality. Our goal of the agroecology tag is what's on the screen. It's to integrate functional natural communities within food, fiber, and fuel production systems to provide wildlife habitat and protect water quality both locally and downstream. Through a process with developing our business plan and um, revising our business plan over the last couple of years, uh, we've maintained or expanded uh, on our objectives for this tag. Uh, primarily, there's two that are, first one is to develop and promote wildlife conservation practices that improve connectivity among our uplands, floodplains, and channels, enhance the viability of those functional ecological processes, and restoring some of our native habitats, such as oak savanna, Tallgrass Prairie, as well as some of our riverine communities um, into our food, fiber, and fuel production systems. Uh, and secondly, it's to develop and promote the conservation practices that improve water quality and wildlife habitat within the Midwest, as well as uh, keeping in mind those downstream considerations. We identified uh, three strategies that we wanted to focus on. Uh, first being to uh, assess the impacts of existing as well as emerging technologies on multiple spatial and temporal scales and to use this information to design effective conservation practices. The second one is to collect and organize data um, to model the impacts of changing land use uh, as well as management practices and environmental stressors on our agricultural conservation. Um, through an understanding of the policies and practices uh, that uh, are applied at those multiple landscape scales. Uh, and third is in order to promote adoption of these conservation practices, uh, we want to have a better understanding uh, of the social and economic incentives available um, to agricultural producers. So to this end, we're also continually working to further identify our metrics and measurement techniques that can be applied across these multiple projects and scales to promote uh, comparability across the, the different scales. Within the tag, uh, what you saw Kristen mention was sort of um, the, the process for identifying some of the research projects. Uh, with regard to the agroecology tag's research interests, um, we're very interested in the ecological impacts of conservation practices. Uh, this, this means continuing to evaluate the environmental impacts of existing practices as well as new practices such as drainage management systems or alternative cropping systems. Um, there's a strong push towards understanding landowner motivations and incentives and how do we determine those motivations and incentives or policies that really influence land management decisions. In regard to mapping and modeling, we want to expand decision support tools that optimize siting of conservation practices. And lastly, we want to use the economic modeling and uh, cost-benefit analysis to evaluate and improve our incentive programs and policies that support our focused conservation efforts. So I want to highlight one of the projects that was uh, proposed to the agroecology core team to, to review. Um, the process that Kristen described earlier um, was one that we went through as well, where we collected a lot of project ideas, reviewed them, and then submitted some to the ETPBR LCC steering committee for consideration for funding. Uh, this is one of the projects that was then approved for funding by the LCC steering committee. Um, and I just want to highlight how this encompasses a lot of the focuses of the agroecology tag. Um, from Rudy Roseline, Raceline, the uh, uh, founder of Raceline Alternative Energy, who's um, involved in this project, he said, we're developing a mixture of grasses and native species that provide ecological services, wildlife habitat, and biomass that will be co-digested with manure. And this is a pro 
process that is looking at how do we use native grasslands, how do we reintroduce them to the landscape in order to use them uh, in current systems to promote energy needs and new development of energy um, sources. Uh, and this is a perfect example of some of the ways that we've been able to leverage um, the, the multiple, the, the knowledge as well as skills of, of multiple sectors. Um, this has universities, government agencies, the private sector, the conservation community all contributing to it. Um, so it's a, if you want to find out more information, the link at the bottom is to this particular uh, article, um, but we'll be following up with this one um, quite a bit. I want to thank especially our core team who was involved in determining many of the, the in reviewing the, pro, the projects that, came, that were proposed as well as reviewing and revising the business plan to make sure that we're, our needs, uh, the needs that we identify in our business plan uh, and the driving force of, of our actions are relevant with today's needs. So what we're hoping for is to promote some of the discussion um, now in terms of, is anyone aware of other groups like this uh, that meet at this regional scale and drive these conversations. So this is kind of what Kristen's mentioning. Our Prairie Restoration Initiative, as well as our floodplain network, serve as some of these regional scale um, drivers of conversation. Are there similar ones who meet uh, at a regional scale that are discussing agroecology needs and uh, future efforts? Um, should the LCC continue to provide this outlet? Um, both as information dissemination as well as having a core team to promote projects. Um, do you have any first thoughts for future uh, possible projects or areas that we should focus on? Or what are the most immediate gaps or needs for research um, on projects related to agroecology? I'll put up my uh, information, but I want to go back to that other slide so you can reference it um, with any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for that great presentation about the potential for an agroecology community of practice across the Midwest. And uh, we'd like to open the lines now for anyone to unmute your phone and address any of these questions or others that you may have, uh, either by phone or in the chat box. I think that the first question there that Andrew has raised is kind of the top of our mind right now as an LCC, and um, we've been facilitating this dialogue across the, the lower Midwest to try to understand that intersection between agriculture and, and ecology, and, but we're wondering if there, if there are other groups or other organizations that are hosting that kind of conversation, or is, is there truly a gap there that the LCC uh, staff and coordinators can fill. So if anyone uh, would be interested in speaking to that, we'd sure be interested in hearing your, your thoughts. All right, well, I can tell it that many of you are probably thinking about these questions. If you have uh, thoughts or suggestions, please feel free to get those to Andrew Stevenson as the Technical Advisory Group Coordinator. Uh, he, his email and phone are, are there on the screen or you can contact any of the Tall Grass Prairie LCC staff. And please join us again next week for the continuing spring webinar series of the Tall Grass Prairie LCC. We'll be speaking during the first half from 2 to 2.30 Eastern Time about the Gulf Hypoxia uh, Precision Conservation Blueprint Initiative that Andrew referenced. And then in the second half, we'll be from 2.30 to 3 Eastern Time, Abigail Derby-Lewis from the Field Museum will be speaking to the Urban Monarch Conservation Landscape, landscape Design and the, the tools that are, will become available for urban conservation planning uh, through that effort across the Midwest. So thank you again for joining us. If you have any questions or suggestions uh, or any additional presentations you'd like to see in this webinar series, please feel free to contact us. And have a great afternoon and evening.